I'm going to talk about two things that we many times say, let's not pray about because it will happen if we do. But I believe sometimes we need to pray for some things and let God minister through us for those things that we pray about. Amen? And I'm going to talk about patience and endurance. I said patience and endurance. It seems like that's a shortage of that in this day that we live. People are on the edge. People are stressed out. People are going more and more and stressed out. And it's time for us to start waiting upon the Lord and have patience that God will see you through. Amen. So I want us to look at the theme for a few moments, patience. I hope that you, well, I can help you build your patience and build some endurance in you because you need it and I need it. We need to be able to stand steadfast in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 35. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 35. It says, therefore, do not cast away. Do not throw away. Do not discard. Amen? Do not cast away your confidence. Confidence. Your assurance. You know that he's going to do it. You're trusting in him. Don't cast away your confidence, which has a great reward. Our confidence is vitally important for patience and endurance. You have to have confidence that God will see you through. You have to have confidence in God to know if he says it, he'll do it. His promises are yea, that's yes, and amen, that so be it. He's not a God that shall lie or the son of God that should repent. But he's a God that will always, always deliver the goods, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance. Endurance. Mickey and I went and saw a movie Friday night. And the name of the movie was The 33. The 33 men that were trapped in the mine in Chile. And they were trapped in that mine. 33 of them had to live down in the mine. It was so deep they couldn't get to them. So deep they couldn't send food to them. They only had a few days supply of food. And they went for weeks and weeks and weeks. And they figured out how to exist. They figured out how to ration. They figured out how to filter water. They figured out they refused, they refused to give in to a hopeless situation. They refused. They said, we're not dying down here. They would have visions of their family. They would have visions of their children, their wife. They would have visions. One wife was pregnant, and he visioned his baby that would come. He had to be there. He couldn't die down in the hole in the ground. He, they, all 33 of them, made a determined factor they was going to live. You see, you got to have endurance when the tough times come. You got to have endurance that's beyond the natural. You got to have endurance that's beyond the pain. Is anybody with me? You got to have endurance beyond the hurt. I don't know if I'm preaching to anybody here this morning. Maybe I'm preaching to me. Every time I prepare a sermon, it's first for me. So I get all excited, holler amen, and shout over this. Just, you know, that's okay. Let me have a jubilee. <laughs> Maybe this is for me. Maybe this is for you. Maybe this is for us. For you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God. I'm not talking about endurance just to float through life. I'm not talking about endurance to be able to continue in sin. I'm talking about the endurance after you've done the will of God. After we've been steadfast, <clears throat> after we've walked in the anointing of God and believed God for every circumstance, amen, need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Promise don't come till after you've endured. Promise don't come till after you've been proven. Promise don't come till after we've been tested. Are you with me? You see, some, some of you are right in the middle of a test right now in your life. 
Some of you are in the middle of some circumstances, some changes that's taking place. You're not sure what tomorrow holds, but you know if you trust God, he's going to see you through. If you don't lose grip, if you don't lose hold, if you don't stop, if you don't quit, he's going to see you through. If you have endurance, James chapter 1, James chapter 1, one of my favorite scriptures. <clears throat> Someone said to me the other day, Pastor, what is your favorite scripture? I said, whichever I'm reading, whichever one I'm reading at the time. Because I love them all. <clears throat> They're life changing. James chapter 1 says, My brethren, count it all joy. And if you want to, I have my Bible, I've got happy written in there. Okay, count it all happiness or joy. When you fall into various trials, now that's a pretty hard thing to do. Now see, I'm going through a test, so let me see if I can find some joy in this. Everything's caved in on me. Where's the joy in this thing? If you'll find the joy in the midst of the problem, in the midst of the trials and tests, you'll know that the testing of your faith produces endurance or patience. This word patience and endurance these two words, <clears throat> these two words dovetail together. Are you with me? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, but let patience or endurance have its perfect work. Let endurance and patience do a work in you that every time you go through something, uh, you'll prove God to be who he is, and you'll know the next time you go through it, you can just wait on him. They that wait upon the Lord, he will renew your strength. You'll mount up on wings like eagles. You'll run and not be weary. You'll walk and not faint. T teach me, Lord, to wait. Or to have patience. Or to wait upon you and to trust you in the midst of the problem. Let patience have its perfect work, not its half-baked work. Not just a little bit of the work. Not just a few little things that might make me feel better. But let it have its perfect work. Are you with me? That you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. How many of you think that's a big order right there? Having a perfect work, lacking in nothing. And if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Not ask everybody else that you know. Not call your best friend. And not call the stock market exchange. Not call the banker. Not call everybody else that you think is going to help you. Chances are they're not going to help you anyway. If any of us lack wisdom, we want to know how, we want to know how to make it through the tough times of life. You want to know how to handle uh, uh, life in the circumstances uh, that you're going through. Uh, don't be running after everybody else that's not going to give you any real spiritual wisdom at all. But see God who gives us all liberally and without reproach and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith. Let him ask in faith. It's important that we walk by faith and not by sight. It's important that we understand what faith is all about. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith reaches out and grabs a hold of hope, pulls hope in the reality, and what you once hoped for now becomes the thing that you're really walking in. Faith knows how to pull it into reality. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, but he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven, tossed, and tossed by the wind. But let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord because he's a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. But blessed is the man, verse 12, blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he has been proved, but when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Powerful scriptures right here, church. Powerful. One of the greatest, I believe one of the greatest reasons for failure in the body of Christ today is because they just don't continue. Pastor Bobby Patton a few weeks ago gave us the statistics how many churches close. Every week. How many Christians quit? Every week. How many pastors are walking out of their pulpits? Every week. 
Well, there's only one reason why they would do that because they're not enduring. Only reason, only reason why they would do that is because they're not continuing in what God originally called them to do and believing God to see them through. They're not, per, they're not persevering until they receive the promise. That's what the scripture says. Persevere or endure until you receive the promise. And we just want to, we need to stand strong. We need to believe God. We need to know that God is more than what we need. A Christian should stand strong in these days. You know, the world's watching you. You know, there's somebody watching me all the time. Am I going to fold? Am I going to give in? Am I going to fold under the pressure? Am I going to stand and believe God? When you've done all, stand. Ephesians says when you've done all. That means, after you've, uh, that means after you've exhausted all of your choices. That means after you've, uh, uh, you, you've been uh, worn out and you wonder if you can keep going. Uh, that means after the devil has hit you with everything that he has to hit you with and you've got your shield up and your shield's all dented and your helmet's on crooked and you've got, and you got, uh, uh, you got dents in your helmet, your breastplate is all dented up and you're dropping your shield. Uh, when you've done all, stand. Pick it up. Hold the shield up. Stand strong. Because once the devil shoots his last dart, he'll have anything else to shoot at you. And then when you stand, God moves in with his power and his anointing. And you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. And whoever stands on the word of God, God will see you through because he's more. He's more willing to see you through than you're willing to stand. We are living in tough times today. We are going through some things. The church is being persecuted around the world. But we need to stand. Faith and patience will bring in maturity in your life. Patience will cause you to grow. Endurance will cause you to believe God whenever it seems like it's not going to work. If you just stand long enough, God's going to see you through. Many of you have been through things in your life and you wondered, are you going to make it? Many of you have raised your children and had some circumstances with your children. You wonder, are they going to make it? Many of us at times in our marriages, uh, uh, we, uh, we had circumstances where we wonder if our marriage is going to make it. And here we are today, still married, still have our children, still believe in God, and God has brought them home, and God has brought people where they need to be because he is more, he is more than what we need to bring us through. In Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5 and verse 3, not only that, but we also glory in the tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. That word perseverance is also endurance. Our tribulation, if you ever hear anybody give testimonies and talk about how good God is and a witness of God's uh, grace in their life, they usually, don't do, they usually don't sit around and talk about all the good things that happened. And they'll tell you what they had to go through, but God brought them through. Oh, yes, I went through that sickness, and it seemed like I wasn't going to make it, and, and that sickness almost overtake me, but God delivered, and miracles came, and, and my body was healed, and I give him praise, honor, and glory. That marriage, it almost didn't make it, but then God intervened, and that marriage is still strong today because God is bigger, bigger than what the attack of the devil was. You see, it's when we go through the problems, when we go through the trials and tests, we can stand back one day and say, God brought me through. God brought me through. Verse 4, in perseverance. Then it says, knowing that the tribulation produces perseverance. Now listen, it's a progressive thing. And then perseverance produces character. Are you with me? And then character produces hope. Now hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The Holy Spirit will cause you to progressively move from one dimension to the other till you're standing on the mountaintop being more than a conqueror. Till you're singing the song uh, that, uh, that down in the valleys he restores my soul. Up on the mountaintop where the breeze is blowing and where the, uh, where the cool air is there and, and, and everything's fresh, but, uh, but the, the, the fertile ground isn't on the mountain, it's in the valley. 
The waters that causes things to grow isn't in the top of the mountain. It's down in the valley. It's in the valley where growth is. It's the valley where, it's, uh, where the water is. It's in the valley uh, that sometimes the testing takes place and we realize who we are in Christ Jesus. Is anybody following me so far? We need to understand patience means to, to restrain, to hold back. Patience means to be steadfast. Patience means, patience means to endure in spite of all opposition, in spite of what I've heard, in spite of what the report is, in spite of how I've been treated. I'm going to stand and I'm going to have endurance because I know the God that I serve. And when we're, when we're willing to stand steadfast and not quit with your walk in the Lord, there will be opposition. Anybody found that out? Anybody found that out after you got saved, there's some opposition. There's, there's going to be people that don't like you. When I gave my heart to the Lord, automatically I lost friends. I mean, you probably never lost any, but I lost friends. When I got born again, some of my family automatically thought I'd lost my mind. I went, I, I was radical. I mean, I should have been put in a white suit and put in a room somewhere. I mean, I, 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 I was just radical for the things of God. I was probably a little bit, on, you know, I was probably a little bit out of the box. But I'm still out of the box. And I'm still a little radical about Jesus. And I still talk to everybody I meet about whether they know Jesus or not. Uh, so uh, just because I'm a little radical, uh, that doesn't mean I'm wrong. That means the anointing of God is still resting on me. You see, the devil comes in like a roaring lion, the scripture says, seeking who he may devour. He comes in to destroy and to steal and to kill, but Jesus comes to give us life and give it to us abundantly. So I walk in the abundant life. I walk in his anointing and his presence. I say, God, tomorrow's going to be a more exciting day than it was today. I can't wait to get up in the mornings to start the day and say, what are you going to do with me today? Hallelujah. Because I'm more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. And I got endurance and I'm going to stand and I'm going to believe God. And not only do I, do I want to be known as somebody that started something, but I want to be known as somebody that finished something. I want to be known as somebody that finishes well, not just starts well. Too many people start, start all kinds of things well, but they don't finish well. I want to be a well finisher. Somebody that crosses the line and breaks the ribbon. And as I'm being coached by the Holy Spirit not to look to the right or the left. Not to look in the grandstand at all the popcorn eaters and, and the hot dog eaters and all the people that are enjoying cotton candy. I'm in a race. I'm running this thing. I'm not going to be distracted by all that stuff. I'm running the race. I'm being coached by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is saying, come on, come on, come on, run. One day I'm going to be like Liz. I'm going to cross the finish line as more than a conqueror. And I'm going to hear, well done, thy just and faithful servant. You've run well. You've run well. You've run well. Quitters never win. And winners never quit. The devil tries to get you to quit walking by faith. The devil tries you to quit claiming your healing. The devil... Cause you to cause you try to cause you to give up and quit before you finish. But I'm a, I'm, I'm a finisher. How many finishers do we have here? Not just starters, but finishers. Hallelujah! We got some finishers in this place. First Timothy, look at First Timothy with me. First Timothy chapter six and verse eleven. I'm going to give you some awesome scriptures, so make sure you write them down. I want you to understand uh, that when you're going through some things, you're going through. Thanks. You're going through. You're not stuck in the middle. When I tell you I'm going through this sickness, that means I'm not going to stop halfway through and camp there and die there. I'm going through. God's going to bring me through. Amen? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. But you, O oh man of God. Oh, I like that, don't you? Where's my buddy Anson at? Anson, Anson many times calls me up and say, all right, man of God. I go, yes, oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> but you, O oh man of God, flee 
these things and pursue righteousness and godliness. Pursue faith and pursue love and pursue patience and pursue gentleness. These are the things we ought to be pursuing. These are the kind of things that will cause you to win the battle. These are the kind of things that will bring you to a place where you don't lose heart. In the tough times and when you wonder, are you going to make it through? Pursue these things and you'll find out God will bring you through. Then in verse 12, fight the good fight. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Well, how do I know it's a good fight, Pastor? The devil just beat me up yesterday. How do I know it's a good fight? Well, you see, in a fight, you might not win every round. You might not win every round, but you're going to win the battle. You might get knocked down a couple of rounds. You might have to get back up. You might have to go back in the corner and bandage up some, uh, some uh, bruises on your face. You might have to go and have somebody give you a little bit of encouragement to stay in there. But if you'll stay in the fight, it'll be a good fight. Because the reason it's a good fight is a fight that you win. If it was a fight that you lost, it wouldn't be called a good fight. It would just be called a fight. Anybody with me? I like the idea that it's all, I'm already determined. I'm, it's already claimed in my life that I'm going to fight a good fight. So it's already been, it's already been scheduled that I'm going to win. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's already down in the book that I'm more than a conqueror, that I'm going to win this thing. I'm going to come out the other end. I'm going to cross the finish line with victory. Fight the good fight of faith. And here's how you do. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. That's the reason why it's so important for the body of Christ to come together. That's the reason why when the church door is open for you to be here. Because you need the connection and the fellowship and the witness of the brethren. And in the world that we live in when there's so much destruction, you need to hear somebody say it's going to be all right. You need to hear somebody say, just keep on keeping on. God's going to see you through. You need to hear somebody say, if you have endurance and you hold on, God's going to bring you to the next level and you're going to, you're going to walk in the high places. You see, it's important that we gather together because our good confession in the presence of many witnesses, you and I are the, I'm making a witness to you right now that I'm going to be more than a conqueror. I'm not giving up. I'm not quitting. I'm running the race. And when you say amen, you're saying me too. You're giving confirmation back to me that yes, we're in this together, Pastor, and we're going to run the race together. And I think it's vitally important. But the Word of God says fight the good fight. You see, we need to understand persistence is to continue in the faith through opposition and with endurance, long-suffering, stand firm, don't give up. See, we need to understand that our building program in our personal life needs to continue. Fight good. Every time something starts to happen, say, I'm walking by faith and not by sight. We get a bad report, say, listen, I'm not believing it. I'm standing on the Word of God. The Word of God says, by His stripes, I'm healed. We need to stand on the word of God. And we need to stand on Psalms 103. It says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all this within me. Bless his holy name, forgetting none of his benefits. And then there's a whole list of benefits. He's our healer. He's the strength of our life. He's a high tower. He's Lord of our life. He'll bring us through every situation. We'll even, we'll even uh, restore our youth and mount up on wings like eagles. I believe God wants us all to walk in the kind of victory that we prove endurance builds character. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Back to verse, verse 35. I want to remind you, therefore, don't cast away your confidence. Don't throw away. Don't throw away. Don't discard your confidence because there is a great reward. A man said one time that persistence, said a persistent young man, persistence young man, persistence. Endurance young man, endurance. 
Patience, young man. Patience. If you're told that long enough, you'll stand. If you hear that long enough, you're going to start saying, that's really going to work for me. I'm going to believe God. I'm going to stand on the word of God. Hebrews 12.1. Hebrews 12.1. Turn there with me. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded with such a great a cloud of witnesses. Now, I don't know how you see this. I don't know how this scripture, I'm going to read it to you, and I'm, I'm going to give you a little insight how I see it. Therefore, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded with such a great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, every sin, which easily besets us, and run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now for a moment, looking at that first part, therefore, since we are compassed about with such a great a cloud of witnesses. Now I told you, when I'm running the race, I'm not going to get distracted with the hot dog stand. And the popcorn smell. And the cotton candy board that the guys has. And even, even the ice cream man. I'm not going to get distracted by that. Even though I love ice cream. But I'm running a race. And I believe, I believe somewhere along the line. And I know in heaven there's no sadness. I know in heaven there's no tears. I know nobody's going to weep over anything in the grandstands that I do wrong. They're not going to see that. But I believe that there's a grandstand gathered around. I think my mom and dad are in the grandstands. I think all the loved ones that went on before us, they're taking their, they've taken their seat in the grandstands. They're watching us run our race. They're not seeing the failures. They're seeing the successes because there's no sadness in heaven. And I think towards the end of the race, when we run our race, they're cheering us on. They're saying, have endurance. Don't quit. Don't give up. Heaven's for real. Jesus is waiting for you. There's streets of gold and there's a mansion that's been prepared for you. According to, uh, according to John chapter 14. In my Father's house are many mansions. If we're not so, I wouldn't have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again to receive you unto myself. That where I am. You shall be also. What a promise. I think, I think the, the, the compass about was such a great a cloud. What's a cloud? That's more witnesses we can count. Thousands and thousands of people has gone on before us, is cheering us on, saying you can make it, it's okay, you can cross the line. And I have to believe that there's those that just are, 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 are saying Jesus did it and you can too. He didn't quit, you don't have to quit. Keep pressing, keep pressing, keep pressing. You're going to make it. Can I hear an amen? amen. You, say, you see, you got to hang around with those witnesses. you got to hang around with those people uh, that believe God. you got to hang around with people that know that you can win and you can finish and you can cross the line. Lay aside every weight, every sin. You know, that's not easy. It's not easy in these days that we live to lay aside everything that caused you to stumble and all the little roadblocks that the devil throws in the way and, and, and all the things he tries to trip you up. Just about time you're, gonna, you're going forward and you're making some progress, you take two steps back. Has that ever happened to anybody but me? Seems like Satan just has a way of just uh, tripping you up. You've got to take two steps back and then you've got to start over. That's when, it, that's when you don't quit. That's when you go forward. So that's how every sin, every way. It's so easy to besets us. You see, we need to press forward. So some of the weights that so easy to beset us isn't necessarily the big sins, what we think, you know, uh, uh, drinking and, and, and carousing and, and running around and all that kind of stuff. Uh, sometimes we think that's all it talks about. I think what's worse than that sometimes is the things that we allow in ourselves to trip us up and stop us from going forward. I'll give you a couple of the sins and the weight we ought to set aside. Number one is procrastination. Always talking about stuff we're going to do, but never do it. Always going to, always starting things, but we don't have time to finish them, so then we start something else. We need to be finishers. 
Don't procrastinate. Amen? And then the other one is indecision. Let's see, I think I'm going to do this. No, I'm not, I, that's not it. I, I'm going to try it. Oh, no, that, that, that's, that's too hard. I'm not going to do that. Indecision. And pretty soon we're like that person in James 1. It says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. When you get double-minded, you can't make a decision. What are you going to do? So you know what we do? We just stand there. We don't do nothing. And if we don't do nothing, there's no progress in our life. And these are some of the things I think that are more important and just as important as some of the things that what we call uh, the big sins. Here's another one, lack of organization. Lack of uh, any kind of vision. Uh, lack of putting things together beforehand. Uh, we need to have some organization in our life. So whenever uh, so when we make a plan and we, and we have a goal, we can go forward. We know where we're going. And then an, another one is lack of interest. Not having any interest. We need to be interested in something. Especially when it comes to the things of God. We need to find out, God, where do you want me to be plugged in? What do you want me to do? And then run with it. Find something that's, that, that's, uh, that stirs your passion up. Uh, something that, uh, that you know you can do, that you'll be a success in it, and you'll go forward, and it'll affect the kingdom of God, and it'll affect other people. You see, these things are so important, we need to realize that. And then here's another one, neglecting to move when you know God wants you to do something. But somebody else can do it. Well, we got a missionary trip. Would you like to go? Yeah, but... Yeah, there's enough people going. They can go do missionary work. Oh, yeah, uh, to serve in the local church. Oh, there are plenty of people there. There's always somebody that will hold up the pastor's arms. I don't need to get involved in that. Are you with me? Is anybody with me? You see, we need to, we need to realize that, that uh, neglecting to move when God's uh, giving you uh, or inspiring you to do something is holding back, and God will have to move to somebody else. We need it so important. These kind of things will bring failure. These kind of things will bring discouragement. These kind of things will stop us right in the middle of our tracks. For a few moments, I'm going to give you a few things, and my time's up, but a few things on how to train yourself to be patient and have endurance. Can I give you just a couple things? Are you with me this morning? Here they are real quick. Number one, you'll find in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 3, Know exactly what you want to do and know what your desires are. Why is that? Because God will give you the desires of your heart. If you don't have any desire, if you don't have any direction, if you don't know what you, what, what you want God to do, how can he do it for you? Amen? Proverbs 16.3 will explain that. Have a strong desire. Have a strong desire for what you want. Find out what it is. God will give you the desires of your heart if you delight yourself in him. And then, and then have confidence in Christ within yourself. Trust him. Trust him in everything. That's the reason why the scripture says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. All things, not a few things. Not a couple of things that I feel good at. Not a couple of things that I've always felt that I'm, uh, that I'm confident in. But he, all things. Whatever you put your hands to, whatever you decide, uh, whatever you have desire to, God will bring you through it. And then in Proverbs 24, verses 3 and 4, and we don't have to turn there. But if you're going to have patience and you're going to have endurance, you've got to have some good planning. You see, if I know where I'm going, I'm going to trust God to get me there. I can wait forever. I can stand and believe God. If things start coming apart, if things aren't working today, if things aren't working this year, if things aren't working this year, I'm going to stand and put it on hold because I know God's going to make it happen. Because I'm trusting him. If he spoke it, he shall bring it to pass. Amen? And then here's another one. Have sufficient knowledge in what you're believing for. Do some research. Don't just say, well, God's going to do this. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm going to build a building. God's going to do this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Find out what it's going to cost. Find out what's the best prices. Find out what it takes to, to get the right people in line with you to make it happen. Is anybody following me this morning? You see, you just can't sit around and say, well, God's going to do it. God's waiting for you to do it. Amen. There was two pastors out fishing one day. 
and they was in their little rowboat, and they got out there, and 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 they, and they had their little their, their little motor, their little outboard, and they got out there in the place fishing, and 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 they fished most of the day. A storm was starting to come, so they reached around, tried to start that motor, and it wouldn't start. They pulled and pulled until they wore themselves out. It wouldn't start. At one pastor, he got down, he hunkered down in the boat, and he says, "I'm going to pray." The other pastor said, "I'm going to row." One was rowing, the other was praying. They got back to land and they were safe. See, it's not just prayer. You got to put a little prayer into action. You got to do some things. Amen. Now, how about if it had just prayed and prayed? Maybe the storm would have came, flooded the boat, hit it, drowned it, went to heaven, said, "God, I thought you was going to take care of me." He could have said, "Well, I had to, I had your brother was going to going to row for you, but you wouldn't let him." Are you with me? See, we need to. Understand how important that is. Then in Romans 12, 6 through 8, it says, Work with the other members of the body of Christ. I need you in my life. I can't accomplish whatever it is. I can't, I can't accomplish the vision of this church without you. When God gave me the vision for this church, and we start building that first building back there where you folks are in the back, that was our first building that we built. I was walking in this building with it empty, just an empty shell. We just put a, a steel building up, and there wasn't no, nothing but just, a, just an empty shell. And in the middle of the night, the echo has come as I would pray and seek God. And I, was off, I felt alone, and I didn't feel there, was, there wasn't enough money to go forward, and there wasn't enough people to uh, put their hands to plow with me. And I cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, uh, you said to build this building. You said to buy this land. And God, what, uh, how are you going to do that? And he said this, I'm going to bring people up down Sheldon Road. It was two lane back then. A little two lane road. We was out in the country back in those days. We're on Main Street now. We used to be in the country. God spoke to me and he said, I'll have people come up and down Sheldon Road and I'll lay it on their heart and they're going to pull in here and they're going to say, what can I do to help you? And the next day, I was on this property staying in a little camper right out here by these trees and a man pulled up with a, he was a contractor and he had a construction truck and he pulled up, knocked on my little camper door. I was spending the night there and I opened up and he said, I want to introduce myself. He said, my name's Lee Stanford. I'm a contractor. God spoke to me driving down Sheldon Road said to come in here and help you anything you want to do to help build this church. You see, God will bring the right people by at the right time. And he brought you by here at the right time. And he's got you in this church because you're going to bloom right here where you're planted. And God's going to use you mightily to do great and mighty exploits. And as we pull the plow together, we're going to cross the finish line. And we're going to stand with endurance and be more than conquerors. Anybody get anything out of this this morning? <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Listen. Don't quit, church. Don't listen to the voices that are echoing in your ear in these days. Don't let anybody stop you doing what you know you should do. And God will raise you up to the next place. And you'll walk in power and anointing. And you know what you're going to hear one day. Listen to me. One day you're going to cross the finish line. And you're going to hear what I believe my sister Liz has already heard. I think she heard it three seconds after she quit breathing. I think she heard this from the heavenlies. I think Jesus looked at her and says, well done, my just and faithful servant. Now that you've been faithful in the small things, he calls this the small things. Now that you've been faithful in the small things, now I'm going to give you greater things. How many of you want to hear that? That's the desire you want to hear. Come on and hear it. Amen. Every head bowed and every eye closed just for a moment. Would you just whisper a prayer for the person next to you? You might not know who they are. They might be your best friend, your wife, your husband. Whisper a prayer right now that God will touch them in a mighty way for the next few moments. Maybe you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus as your own personal Savior. Maybe you've never asked him to come in your heart. You know all about religion. You all know, you know, you've, you know about Jesus. You heard about him in Sunday school, whatever. 
that you really never had a personal experience with him, why not this morning? Why not make him Lord of your life? Maybe you're here this morning and you used to serve God. You used to be excited. You had the passion that I've been talking about this morning. You was running the race. You was cooking and booking. You was seeing soul saved, life changed, but somebody wounded you. You got hurt by some church somewhere. Maybe some pastor didn't treat you right. Maybe even a family member rejected you. So little by little, it started having an effect on you. And you said, well, maybe I'm a little too radical about this. Maybe I'll back off a little. And you backed away, but the only thing is, you back so far away, God can't use you anymore. Maybe it's time for you to come home. Maybe it's time for you to come back and say, I'm going to endure to the end. I'm going to run this race. I'm going to set aside every hurt, every wound, every circumstance that's hindering me, and I'm running. I'm going to finish this race. It's time for you to come home. If that's you and you meet either one of those categories, you need to make a decision to ask Jesus to come into your life. Or you need to come back where he can use you again. Would you give this pastor the privilege to pray for you right now? Lift up your hand. Put your hand up and say, that's me. God bless you, dear. Say, that's me. Is there somebody else? Lift up your hand. Say, that's me. Pastor, pray with me. That's me. I see that hand, brother. It's time to come home. I see it. I see it. Somebody else. Lift up your hand. Say, that's me, pastor. I'm sitting on the sidelines. I'm on the shelf. All kind of people told me I better get back in the right standing with God, but I've kind of just not paid attention. Basically, I'm, I'm coming home today. I'm coming home this morning. If that's you, raise your hand. Stand with me, if you will, please, everybody in the house. Oh, he's all I need. Oh, he's all I need. Jesus is all I need. Those that just raised your hand, would you step out of that aisle right now? Meet me here. One of here is. Two of you that raised your hand, I want you to come down here and meet this couple right now because they're going to minister to you and pray with you. I believe God with you. 